is going on solo fam my name is john solo and this month on messed up origins we've been running a mythological gauntlet a few weeks ago i covered the origins of hephaestus the greek god of blacksmithing and last week i dissected the polynesian deities that inspired the main plot of disney's moana so i figure why not finish strong by diving deep into some norse mythology this week and explore the true story behind the all-father himself Odin. Now the reason I say true story is that I feel like while most people know Odin as the supreme Viking god, the most exposure they've had to him is through the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which, big surprise, is not the most historically accurate. Don't get me wrong, I'm still a fan of the Marvel character and I think they did a really great job with putting their own artistic spin on Norse lore, but at the end of the day there are some huge differences between their Odin and the real Odin and I want to talk about them. I would also love to work God of War's Odin into this comparison, but sadly we still don't know too too much about him yet, so maybe another time. Before we jump into the meat of this episode, I do want to ask that you hit those like and subscribe buttons, especially if you want more content like this in your sub box and recommended feed. And now, the messed up origins of Odin. So first, let's talk about Disney's Odin and his ascension to the throne of Asgard, because while very different from the original myth, it's still a pretty interesting story. And to be clear, this is just how it goes down in Marvel's cinematic universe, not the comics. I'd actually love to compare and contrast those one day, but right now I'm only knowledgeable about the movie, so in the interest of not making a complete ass out of myself, I'm only going to talk about those. Anyway, Disney's Odin was the son of Bor, a great king of Asgard. Odin had several brothers, but they all died in the many wars Asgard fought to keep the nine realms of Yggdrasil safe, so after Bor was killed in battle, Odin took over the throne. Sometime after getting that shiny new crown, Odin and his daughter Hela took it upon themselves to conquer the other realms. While riding his eight-legged steed known as Slepnir, they slaughtered both monsters and the innocent, drowning entire kingdoms in blood and tears until they all agreed to join Asgard's empire. At a certain point, we don't know exactly when, Odin realized that peace was the true way to unite the realms, but Hela disagreed and tried to kill the Allfather and take the the throne for herself. Fortunately, he was able to defeat his daughter, but realized that because she was destined to play a role in Ragnarok, the end of the world, he didn't have the power to kill her for good, so instead he sealed her away in hell and bound the lock to his life force. Fast forward about a thousand years into his tenure as king when he finally realizes that the workload is a bit much for him to handle by himself and marries Frigga because he knows that her wisdom and strength will make her a great companion. Together they had a boy named Thor who Odin decided would be heir to his throne one day and then they adopted a Jotun baby named Loki who was left to die due to his small size by Odin's rival, the giant king Laufey. Now for those who are unaware where, like me before I started researching for this video, Odin, Thor, Loki, and the rest of the Asgardian gang are not actually gods, they're just Asgardians. Basically, they're aliens that look like humans and have superhuman powers, with the royal bloodline typically being the strongest. So why are they called gods, you ask? Well, at some point, the Asgardians made a trip to Earth where they met the Norse people and taught them their language, about their culture, and displayed some of their otherworldly abilities. This led to the Norse people believing they were gods and giving them nicknames that described them as such. Those trips to Earth became a tradition for the royal family, and when Odin took Loki and Thor there, they were called the God of Mischief and God of Thunder, respectively. It's a pretty funny explanation if you ask me, and if I'm being honest, I kind of wish that's really how the Norse gods were invented, because that would mean they're real, and that would be pretty tight. But that is about as far as we need to go into the Marvel Universe for now, because I want to compare that Odin's rise to the godly ones. For starters, let's talk about his parents. Odin was in fact the son of Bor, but he also had a giantess mother named Bestla. Bor was the son of Bori, the very first of the Aesir, who are gods and not aliens in this version, but neither of them were considered kings or royalty because the world wasn't even made at that time. It wasn't until Odin and his two brothers, Fili and Ve, were born that things were shaken up. They slayed the evil giant known as Amir and used his body to make the world. Then they took glowing sparks from Muspelheim, the realm of fire, and scattered them throughout the cosmos to light up the heavens and earth. After that, they took some logs they found on the beach and turned them into the first humans, Ask and Embla. Then they built the kingdom of Asgard, just like that. For some reason after this, Fili and Ve don't get mentioned a lot and Odin just becomes the de facto ruler out of nowhere, which I honestly like less than Marvel's explanation of them dying in battle, but hey, it's an almost thousand year old book, so it's not going to be perfect. So not long after Asgard is built, Odin marries Freak, daughter of Fjorgen, who is the male personification of the Earth, and they go on to have several kids, but the identity of those kids is still debated to this day. Snorri Sturluson, who wrote the Prose Edda, one of our two primary resources for the Norse religion, said that all of the Aesir are Odin's children, but experts aren't 
sure if that's his personal view or something that was generally believed because very few of the gods are explicitly labeled as such. The few that we can be sure of are Baldur and Had by Frigg, Vidar with Greeter, a giantess, Vali with Rinder, the giantess, and of course we can't forget Thor, whom he had with Fjorgen, the female personification of the earth, not to be confused with Frigg's father of the same name. To those wondering where Loki comes into play, he is still the son of a Jotun named Laufey, only Laufey is his mother's name and his father is a giant called Farbauti. Why Stan Lee decided to name his father after his mother is anybody's guess. Maybe it was just catchier? As for Hela, in real Norse myth, her name is just Hel, and she's actually the daughter of Loki. We're gonna revisit her in a future episode. But now that you know exactly how Odin's ascension compares between the Marvel and Norse universes, let's talk about the kind of god he was and how his followers worshipped him. We have talked about a lot of gods on the channel over the years, and some have had very convoluted backgrounds, but I am not exaggerating when I say that Odin is the most complicated of all of them. It's true that he was an incredibly wise and ultra-powerful being that was respected throughout the realms, but before we get into those myths, I want to tell you about the flip side of that coin that no one ever talks about. And it starts with the various skills and phenomenon he's associated with. War, wisdom, magic, and poetry. There may be nothing odd about that to you, but in the Viking age, those were very contradictory domains to be associated with. War and wisdom were masculine pursuits, while magic and poetry were considered feminine, and it's for this reason that many Norse people thought that Odin's behavior was rather shameful. But here's the thing, Odin wasn't the type to let people's perceptions of him get in the way of accomplishing his goal of soaking up every bit of knowledge that he could. He knew that each of those pursuits could expand his worldview in advantageous ways, so he wanted to master all of them. As a result, the Norse people who considered Odin to be their their specific patron god were typically elite or exceptional in their craft, whatever it was. Kings and chieftains often claimed a blood relation to the god, but outlaws, who were the worst of the worst kinds of criminals, were also known to worship him. And the warriors who were closest to Odin were some of the most terrifying forces on the battlefield. They were known as berserkers, a word that originally meant bear shirts. These were the fighters who could let their inner animal take over and would charge into battle without armor or concern for their own lives, killing everyone and everything they could, with their victims being considered sacrifices to the god of war. After hearing that, it probably won't surprise you that Odin's name, Othin, can be translated to the ecstatic one, the inspired one, or the furious one, with each of these words attempting to describe this frenzied mental state that was so overpowering that it was felt to be divine in nature. Odin isn't the only name he's known by, though. In fact, over 200 different names for the god have been found in a variety of countries, with each of them referring to things he presides over, his accomplishments, or other beings he's related to and these are just a few of them. The oldest names we found for the Allfather are Wodan, Woden, or Wotan, and that is supposedly where we get the term Wednesday or Woden's Day the more you know. Back to his domains though, you might think that because Odin is known for his wisdom that he'd be a similar kind of war god as Athena, but in reality he was more comparable to Ares, hence the whole berserker thing. Odin didn't care much for strategy or even honor when it came to winning wars. All he was after was that rush of charging into battle and the victory that soon followed. In fact, Odin loved that feeling so much that if he couldn't find any conflict to join in, he'd often find ways to turn allies against each other. Kinda shady, right? This behavior is what led to him being despised as a gratuitous troublemaker while also revered as a wise king, which I think is reflected in the movie when they talk about his earlier tyrannical days on the throne and how he evolved into the benevolent ruler we all know. But to reiterate, Odin really didn't care what you thought about him as long as you respected his power and recognized his role as overseer of the cosmos. So what is it about Odin that makes him so damn wisdomous that I have to mention it every 30 seconds? Well, there's a few things. For one, despite being all powerful, he was still willing to recognize his weak areas and admit when he didn't know something, which would allow him to take corrective measures and improve. There's actually quite a few myths about this process too, one of the most well known being when he sacrificed his eye to Mimir. Unfortunately, there's no complete version of the story in either the prose edda or poetic edda, so we can only theorize about how it went down, but the exchange is referenced in quite a few poems. Basically what happens is Odin visits Mimir, arguably the 
wisest of the Aesir gods, who spends all of his time in solitude and drinking from a well at one of Yggdrasil's roots that's said to contain great knowledge. Odin asks him if he can have one drink, but he only agrees to it if the Allfather can give him something of equal or greater value in return. Knowing that Odin had the ability to see far and wide, Mimir said to give him one of his eyes, and the Allfather didn't even bother asking if he was serious or try to negotiate his way down to a pinky toe. Instead, he scooped his eye right out of his head, the sources never specify which eye, and gave it to Mimir in exchange for a drinking horn filled with Wells water, which he finished in just a few gulps. So quite a bit different than the Marvel movie where he lost the eye in battle, though I'm sure he gained some wisdom from that too, like always protect your eyes. Now, if you think that was a heavy sacrifice for him to make, just wait until you hear about the time he hung himself. Yeah, he went on all kinds of journeys like this where he was in complete solitude and pursuing a goal that mostly benefited himself, like gaining wisdom. During his travels, he'd typically don a fake name and disguise himself as a wanderer. So if you've ever seen Odin portrayed wearing dirty old rags instead of the kingly fits you'd expect, that's why. And to those thinking that a king leaving his kingdom for long periods of time to pursue matters of self-interest is not a very noble thing to do, you and the Norse people have something in common. Like I said, Odin is a complicated god, but onto the hanging men. See, just like how in Greek mythology we have the three fates, in Norse mythology we have the Norns, who basically function the same way. Only in addition to spinning and cutting a thread of life, they carve magic symbols called runes into Yggdrasil's trunk and influence the lives of mortals and gods that way. In the early days of the cosmos, the Norns were the only beings who knew how to read and use runes, but being cut off from an entire form of magic was not something Odin was going to tolerate for very long. However, he knew that for the runes to reveal themselves to him, he had to prove he was both worthy and committed by making a massive sacrifice. And what sacrifice could be bigger than his very own life? After telling the other gods he was to receive no assistance, Odin hung himself from a branch of the world tree, stabbed himself with his trusty spear, Gunnir, which never misses its mark, and silently stared downwards into the shadowy waters below. For the next nine days and nine nights, he hung there in a delicate balance between life and death until the runes finally appeared. From those runes, Odin gained a variety of abilities. He could heal mental and physical wounds, bind his enemies and destroy their weapons, raise the dead, make women fall in love with him, and more. But as powerful as this made him, it was still not enough wisdom for the Allfather, and that is where the myth about the meat of poetry comes in. Disclaimer, this is actually a pretty long story, so I'm going to give you the abridged version today, but once again, I plan on covering it in more detail in a future video. My to-do list for this series already has, like, 30 topics on it. Anyway, it's time for us to meet another wise being. His name is Kvasir, and he was made from the spit of all the gods, both Aesir and Vanir alike. Yummy. Kvasir would travel around the realms, amazing strangers with his ability to answer any questions presented to him, but one day, some evil dwarves ambushed him, slit his throat, and mixed his blood with honey to make a potion that granted wisdom and the gift of poetry. Well, those dwarves end up getting the potion taken from them by a giant named Suttung, who sealed it deep in the mountains and left his daughter Gunlad to stand guard. Now, as you'd expect, Odin is a pretty busy guy, so he doesn't exactly have time to pay attention to every little thing going on in the Nine Realms. That's where his ravens Hugin and Munin, whose names mean mind and memory, come in. Every morning, the Allfather sends them flying all over the world to retrieve as much information as they can before returning at dinner time to inform him of what they saw or heard. One night, they return to Asgard and tell Odin all about this magical potion that grants wisdom and poetic ability, and he decides he must have it. He tracks it down to the mountains where Gunlad is guarding it, drills into the mountain with the help of her uncle Baugi, and once inside, transforms himself into the form of a handsome giant. He charms Gunlad into sleeping with him for three consecutive nights, and after gaining her trust, she allows him to have a sip from the meat of poetry. Only, I guess, to Odin, the word sip is up for interpretation, because he straight up chugs all of it, and before his lover can even react, he transforms into an eagle, then flies out of that cave right back to Asgard, where he pukes it up into three sacred vats. Now, are you ready for the best part of the story? It turns out the giant Suttung wasn't too happy about Odin sleeping with his daughter and stealing his brew, so he also took the form of an eagle to try and chase him down. By the time they reached Asgard, though, the Allfather was in such a rush to drop the payload that some of it squeaked out of his ass and not only blasted Satung right in the face, but also fell down to earth and is said to be the cause of bad poetry. Isn't that amazing? Finally, I have an explanation for why Shakespeare is so painful to read. He clearly just drank the mead that came out of Odin's ass. 
So we had a lot of fun in that last section, but now it's time to get serious. No more poo-poo or farts in this section, son. Let's talk about death itself. You see, in addition to being a war god, Odin was also closely associated with death. The belief was that half of all warriors that fell in battle would have their souls led to Valhalla by Odin's Valkyries, also known as the Choosers of the Slain. It was in Valhalla that the warriors would pass the time by drinking, playing games, fighting, and drinking some more until the dawn of Ragnarok, where they would ride into battle against the forces of hell alongside Odin himself. Sadly, we don't have time to get into all the specifics of how Ragnarok goes down, but I do want to touch on the very different roles Odin plays in the original and Disney versions. In the movie, Odin basically just reaches the end of his rope, dissolves into pixie dust, and blows away in the wind. And because his life force was tied to the lock on his daughter Hela's prison, she escapes and Ragnarok begins. She takes out the entire Asgardian army, reanimates the fallen soldiers that fought alongside her and Odin in the early days of his rule, and fully resurrects her trusty steed, the wolf Fenris, who is really scary and really tough. But in the original myth, Odin is there for the battle to end all battles, and believe it or not, is devoured by Fenrir, the wolf who inspired Fenris, and also Loki's son. So I guess you would say that's a bit less peaceful than how it went in the movie. Don't worry though, his death is avenged by his son Vidar, who uses his massive shoe that's made of all the leather that mortal shoemakers discard to prop Fenrir's mouth open and stab his sword down his throat. I mean, it's still not a happy ending, the world basically implodes after that, killing all of the gods and mortals along with it but at least your boy was avenged. With the end of the world comes the end of this episode though, so I hope you enjoyed it and learned yourself something new. I'm sorry that I had to leave out a few things for the sake of time and the flow, but I promise I'll make it up to you in future installments. Now, Solo fam, if you would be so kind as to hit those like and subscribe buttons, it would mean a whole lot to me. My brain nearly exploded while writing this video and I would love for that to not be in vain. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram because even though our next world war will be caused by one of those, they're a great way to stay updated on messed up origins news. Also, I announced something pretty recently on Instagram that I think you guys are gonna wanna hear. And hey, since you're gonna check that out anyway, you might as well follow Gunther. Legend has it that when he hits 10,000 followers, he'll finally open his eyes all the way. I'll see you all again next Thursday, probably with another messed up origins video. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.